you should be able to uh, present. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us on our first meeting uh, of the public uh, series of Embodied AI. Um, um, today, we are hosting uh, Drew Batra from uh, Georgia Tech. Um, there, he's an associate professor there and also a research scientist at Facebook AI Research. Uh, his research interest lies in uh, the intersection of machine learning, computer vision, natural language processing, and AI. And the long-term goal of his research is to develop agents that uh, see, talk, uh, act, and reason. Um, and he's a recipient of uh, plenty of different awards, uh, just to name a few, Presidential Early Career Award, um, uh, early career award for scientists and engineers and uh, many more. Uh, we are very happy uh, to host them here today. Um, and just a couple of communication rules. Um, I am going after uh, I finish talking, I'm gonna mute everyone. Uh, and uh, you can raise your hand using the Zoom's raise the hand button if you have any uh, questions at any point during the talk. I will mute you to ask your questions, but please mute yourself uh, after you're done speaking. Uh, and at the end of the talk, we'll try to have a 10 minute uh, open discussion. And, um, and that's pretty much it. So um, let's actually start. Dhruv, are you okay that uh, we interrupt you for questions? Yes, that's perfectly fine. And in fact, preferred, please do. Okay, uh, can people see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, so uh, thank you folks for having me. I think this is a great initiative. I am glad you guys are doing it so that uh, I don't have to. I think somebody should have should do it. I'm glad you, you folks are doing it. Um, and this is a new talk for me. I haven't given this too many places. I've given this once internally, uh, but we'll, we'll see how this goes. Um, what I'd like to talk about is the specific project of the blind agents uh, build maps. And um, more broadly, I'd like to maybe pitch the message of embodiment as a pathway to intelligence, which I will pitch towards the end because it feels like people already sold on that. If you're here, you kind of buy that because if you didn't buy that, you wouldn't be here. Um, okay, so uh, we actually uh, internally at FAIR just went through a vision doc writing exercise for the embodied AI area. And so we had to come up with a definition. What the hell is embodied AI? Um, and so definitions are interesting. I went out looking for definition of uh, AI, and turns out the definition of AI is pretty easy to write. Uh, it's the definition of intelligence that's hard. Um, so AI is the science of science and engineering of intelligent machines. It sort of does, it transports all of the heavy lifting to the def definition of intelligence. Uh, and I really encourage people to read uh, John McCarthy's essay on this, which apparently he wrote at 2 a.m. Um, but it's, it's a wonderful essay. He just answers a bunch of questions that are wonderfully clear. Um, and I think we just piggybacked on that. If that's the definition of AI, then the definition of embodied AI is it's the science and engineering of intelligent machines with a physical of virtual embodiment. Um, turns out that the heavy part is not uh, any of the AI part, it's the intelligent part. If you can define intelligence, there's a sequence of other definitions you can define. Um, we think of uh, agents and embodiment as coming in two forms, physical embodiment in terms of robots, virtual embodiments, or like in terms of virtual robots, but also virtual assistants. Uh, so the embodiment is the human. You still have to perceive the world from the human's perspective and you have to solve some of the similar problems, but you don't have actuation. You have sensing, you have cognition, but you don't have actuation because actuation is, is with the human. Um, and we think that there's an interesting slew of, uh, of problems that become just come to the forefront when you make this transition. Um, the thing that I'm sort of using an overarching framework for my talk today is this hypothesis that intelligence emerges in the interaction of an agent with an environment and as a result of sensory motor activity. And that's sort of hopefully something that I'll come back to. Uh, hopefully what I will present is a brick in the wall that supports this claim. Um, I actually have two talks. Uh, I'm only giving one of them here, don't worry. Uh, one of them is uh, talking about uh, this transition from Habitat 1.0 to Habitat 2.0, which is about 
uh, interactive agents. Uh, I'm not talking about that here. Uh, if you want to talk to me about that offline, I'm happy to. Uh, but what I'm talking about here is just how do we use navigation, sim base simulation for navigation type research. Um, and what I will do is I'll talk about two things specifically. I'll quickly tell people about a paper that we did at iClear last year. I will not go into details of those because it's, it forms the, the language and the abstraction and the infrastructure for my key content, which is uh, blind agents navigating. So let's go into the first one. Um, this is work that uh, Eric Wyman's led. Uh, this was uh, at iClear last year. The task, the, the question we were trying to answer is how far can we scale model-free reinforcement learning methods for embodied visual navigation? It's a packed question, so I will unpack it. What do I mean by embodied visual navigation? I mean something specific. Uh, I just mean point goal navigation. Uh, no semantics, no language, just point goal. There is an agent, it's spawned in an environment uh, shown here. Um, it is given a goal coordinate relative to itself. The top-down map is purely for illustration. If you give the access to a top-down map, path planning from start to end to a coordinate is a homework assignment problem given in an intro to AI class. But if you do not give access to that map, then this is an open research question of how do you navigate from onboard sensing. The onboard sensing here is you have an egocentric depth camera, you have an egocentric RGB camera, and you have an ego motion sensor that can update your location and therefore the location of the goal as you move. Um, and so this is what an episode in the life of such an agent looks like. It navigates, it knows where the goal is, and uh, it you know, the blue path is the agent traverse path and the green path was the shortest path. The fact that those two are close suggests that this is a highly efficient path. Uh, you should not a priori expect to get really close to that because getting close to the shortest path on a map suggests that you know about the environment. Like that, that's, that's a pretty high bar. It's not clear that you can get 100% in terms of path efficiency. Okay, if you talk to a classical roboticist, which uh, over the last few years, I've gotten into the habit of doing. I highly recommend it. Um, they are wonderful people, but they sort of, you know, they just need a bit more convincing about learning. They will tell you that uh, this problem has a well understood solution structure. And that structure looks like that there are three sub problems there is a mapping problem, there's a localization problem, and there's a planning problem. Um, the localization problem you're assumed is solved. So there's mapping and planning. Construct a partial map and plan on it. Uh, explore to the frontiers of your unknown and then operate. I like talking to roboticists, but not following their advice. So we're going to do none of that. We're going to make just no assumptions about the problem. This is going to be entirely model free. I know nothing about the problem domain. And I'm not saying that's the right way to solve the problem. I'm just saying, I'm going to explore the limits of this question. What I specifically mean is, we're going to take an RGB uh, or a depth frame. We're going, to in, we're going to take the goal coordinate at every timestamp. We're going to encode the image with a, with a CNN. Uh, you know, this, you can tell this was done a year and a half ago, because if I was doing this today, you would see a transformer written here. But I'm not tied to the tools here. The, the, the big picture is that I'm not making any assumptions about the kind of architecture I'm building. And there's going to be a recurrent policy that has a hidden state, and it's going to output a value function and an action. Turn left, move forward, turn right. And I'm just going to unroll this out and, and operate based on that. By the way, so far, this may as well have been the architecture for a video captioning model. Like I could have given you a video on the top, and the output at the bottom could have been tokens indicating captioning. A man is walking down the street. The fact that I'm going to use this for navigation is not at all obvious looking at this architecture. The only place where we make any understanding that this is a navigation problem is in the reward function. The reward is going to be, if you get to your goal, great, we'll give you a constant positive uh, reward. Along the way, we're going to give you reward shaping. So if you are reducing your distance to target, you'll get positive reward and we'll penalize you just for existing so that you get efficient at not existing. Um, 
And this is the only place where we interface with the fact that this is a spatial navigation problem. Um, and in some sense, I am taking a fairly radical empiricist viewpoint. I am, there are no task specific modules. There's no slam. There's no concept of mapping. There's no path planning. There is no domain specific inductive bias. There's no spatial memory. There's no 2D memory. There's no knowledge of projective geometry. There's no knowledge of 3D. Um, there are no additional learning signals. There's no mapping supervision. There's no auxiliary tasks. There are, there's no image net pre-training. There's no expert demonstration. Um, there's, there are no look ahead search trees as in Go. Um, there are no learning tricks of any kind in the sense that there's no curriculum. There's no replay buffer. There's no research to partial uh, successful states. It is longer for me to list down what we didn't do, but could plausibly have done than what we did do, which is just on policy episodic reinforcement learning on steroids. We are going to let our agent initialize it entirely from scratch, act, get rewards, dense rewards, and update with the gradients of proximal policy optimization. That's it. Um, and then we're going to see, let's scale this. Like how can we make this work by just scaling? In some sense, that's where the entire habitat effort has dedicated its, its attention to how fast can we go? Uh, in terms of navigation, we're, you know, in, we're about 50x faster than anything else out there. Um, we, we, we can do things, we can simulate things in, on the order of uh, 10,000 FPS frames per second. And that's important because you can get to experiments that you couldn't run before. Uh, so the faster you can simulate, the faster you can run this loop between perception and action. Um, we're not going to stop there. Uh, the key essence of DDPPO or decentralized distributed PPO is that you can actually distribute the experience gathering part to multiple GPUs across multiple nodes. You can each, you can conduct rollouts, compute gradients of PPO objective, and just synchronize them by actually having a synchronous stage where you're just gathering all the gradients, take a step, and this essentially works out. This is like, this is the stuff that systems people consider the first attempt that is obviously not going to work, but this works out. This works out fine. Um, in fact, if you scale this to 256 GPUs, you can get something like 200x speed up. So this is close to near linear speed up. You get two or, you know, you get 10 to the five coming from the speed of the simulator. You get 10 to the two coming from GPUs. The rest you bake in with time, you just wait. So how far can we scale this? Um, we can scale this quite far. Um, and so this is the sort of the key result in that paper. On the x-axis is amounts of experience. It's in log scale going from going to a billion from 10 million. Um, and ultimately it scales out to 2.5 billion steps of experience. Um, on the y-axis is success. How, how, uh, uh, how many times is my agent getting to the target location and stopping within I think it's 0.3 or 0.2 meters off the target location. Uh, this is not success on training environments. This is success on testing environments. So in new environments, it has never seen before. On new episodes, it is nearly 100% of the time, 99.99, it's reaching that. Uh, this was this required us about 180 GPU days. Um, it accomplished in three wall clock days with 64 GPUs. Gets you 99.9% .9 success on this one data set. Uh, there are some harder versions of the data set, but it's not quite 100%, but it, in essentially it doesn't matter. It's, it gets there and it gets, gets there quite efficiently as well. It gets there with something like high 90s in terms of path efficiency or SPL, which suggests that it's operating close to the shortest path it could have taken if it had access to the map, which is a surprising non-obvious statement at all that it should be possible. This is that agent spawned in this environment, it basically traverses a path that you might compute if I asked you to create a shortest path from source to target. Um, this is another agent, this is a more complicated environment. It's going to pass through a sequence of hallways and you know, in hindsight, it sort of looks obvious, but it's not obvious at all why this wasn't explored or this pathway wasn't explored or this uh, entry point wasn't explored and so on. Um, there is emergence of backtracking behavior. 
So we find that in some cases it does make mistakes. Uh, it had to enter this room, the shortest path does. It overshoots. Um, and ultimately there is the depth sensor tells you that you can't go left. The goal sensor is asking you to go, go left and this agent backtracks, it goes back. Uh, it, has, it does not thrash, it has an aspect of memory um, and it enters the room and this time reaches the, the target. Okay, so to answer that question, how far can we scale model-free reinforcement learning? Um, surprisingly far, I would not have guessed that just by knowing ego motion and egocentric RGBD, uh, I, I admit that there's no noise here. There's no sensor noise. There's no ego motion noise. There's no actuation noise. But I would not have guessed that this problem is entirely learnable and generalizable. Um, we've done some experiments and you folks have as well and others uh, have as well on you know, what happens when you don't have GPS and compass and like, you know, it's rapidly improving. Um, turns out that if you didn't have localization, the, our best known results in 2020 were 10%. Now they're greater than 70% on the same benchmark. Um, object goal navigation was something like three to 5% last year. It's up to like mid thirties. So we're now getting understanding of semantics as well. So things are improving. Um, and this is, this is an interesting avenue. I don't think this will solve everything, but I think it was worth pursuing uh, and finding out where the limits lay. Okay, I'll pause there to see if there are any questions. And for the rest of my talk, I will focus on presumably why you're here. Ooh, uh, am I selecting someone? Uh, hello, Professor Patel. Oh, I can uh, do it, yeah. Thanks, Ian. Hey, Gunal. Yeah, so my question is, so in the beginning of the DDPPO talk, you mentioned that, okay, if, if the agent is given a top-down map, then essentially it's it's almost a solved problem. And then you, uh, then we saw that, okay, DDPPO learns a near-perfect uh, agent, but essentially it learns through 2.5 billion frames, which is essentially a very large compute. Maybe there are more sample efficient algorithms now after that work. But what I want to ask is if, you believe that top-down maps, if given top-down maps, the agent will learn very fast. Is the fact that we can build a top-down map by just exploring the environment the most essential component when it comes to learning a sample efficient agent? I think that's an excellent question. Uh, so first, just a clarification. Uh, if you are given a top-down map, um, then there is not even a learning problem. Then it's just an optimization path planning problem. Um, there's no learning to be done there. Um, I think it comes down to where do maps come from? Uh, so either you can write down an explicit exploration stage where you go around exploring the environment, first construct a thorough comprehensive map, and then you're ready to answer amortized queries of source to target navigation. And you make an assumption that if your world does not ever change, then this is perhaps uh, in the long run, the best thing that you can do. I would argue that the world changes, maps are never accurate and assuming that you have access to maps of the world is a fairly strong assumption. Um, and so what we are trying to get rid of that assumption, if maps are important to be built along the fly, then you should build them. Then there are approaches that will build maps along the fly and we will compare the with map without map approaches. But that's the, that's the stand I'm taking. Okay, so then of course, like one major criticism of simulation that comes is that a lot of things are assumed given like the top down views, which we cannot assume in the real world. So like, you think in future, the geometry based approaches that can, you know, transfer a, a egocentric view maybe into, into a top down view, like something, something like a Hawkeye view, like to build more efficient maps, maybe that would be important in the long run, if, if with map agents are to perform better. Maybe, but just to Clarify, you made a claim that we are assuming top-down view. We are not assuming top-down view. Um, that was just for visualization. The approach is just using an egocentric RGBD camera that you can affix to a robot. And we've done sim to real experiments of this kind of an approach as well. Um, the hard assumption that we are making that roboticists subject to is not the egocentric RGBD camera, it's the localization. Indoor localization does not work well and ego motion is not noise free. And so there's a lot of noise in estimating how much you're moving. And so that has to be relaxed. And I think that's a fair criticism. So maybe the role of maps is to just know how far you've moved. 
that's a reasonable claim. Because if you can know how far you've moved, then you don't need the map to navigate. Maybe that's just the role of maps. I'm open to that. What I'm just present, the evidence that I'm presenting that I can support my claim is in the absence of noise, in the presence of localization, you don't need maps. That's the only claim I'm making. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right, so, uh, all right, so the next thing, I, which is the sort of thing that I really want to dive into is a piece of work that we've just concluded. It was also led by Eric Wymans. And here we wanted to test the cognitive map hypothesis. It's this idea that says brains of organisms build internal spatial representations of the environment. That you and I, when we're walking around, we have a sense for where X building is and Y building is, is our, you know, if we're sitting at our desk and if I ask you, can you point to your living room or kitchen? We sort of maybe can. That idea uh, is the idea of like cognitive maps. Um, I highly encourage you to read this paper. This, this entire line of inquiry started from Edward Tolman's paper. The title is unnecessarily gendered. Uh, it's called uh, Cognitive Maps in Rats and Men. Um, but the style of writing is just very different. It's just like brutally, uh, like to the point. Um, and it's, it's a fairly interesting read. Um, and what, what experiments Tolman presented was that you take, um, you take mice or rats, I forget which one. He said rats and men, so these must be rats. You take rats and you train them in this sort of an apparatus. They're released at A, they enter into a, a large area B, uh, the food is located at G, uh, they have a sense of smell, so they sort of ultimately start going down this hallway and they learn that they can reach food here. You then change the apparatus um, where the, uh, the, the tube that they were, or the narrow passageway that they were used to going through C is now blocked. And what they are instead presented with are multiple options and pathways that they could pursue. Tolman's observation is, and his hypothesis was that if you are building a spatial organization of this space, if you know that food G from C is diagonally in this direction, then you kind of know which tube you want to pursue. If you are just memorizing pixels or sensors to actions type of behavior, where you smell olfactory gradients and you sort of, you know, have memorized, I go straight and then I turn left and then I turn right, then you do not know what, where you should go uh, because you don't have a spatial sense of where the goal is located. This was his claim and turns out that he presented results that rats actually do pick uh, things that are generally in the right direction. Um, this is not just about rats. Um, this, uh, these sort of phenomena have also been reported about chimpanzees. There's a fascinating experiment that Menzel reports uh, where they, uh, a, a trainer will carry a chimpanzee and traverse this route in the order of numbers listed, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then the, uh, and then the chimpanzee will be left at particular place. Oh, sorry, I should say at each one of these locations, there is food buried at, at that spot. Um, this is not just a clear open space. Uh, there are trees, there are obstacles that are just not been shown on the map here. Then the chimpanzee is released into this wild at this S start location. The chimpanzee has not seen this pathway being traversed 15 to 17 to 18 to 14. It has not seen that pathway. It traverses a pathway that you know, Menzel claimed essentially looked like greedy search approximation for the traveling salesman problem, that you go to the next closest place and the next closest place and the next closest place. If you were memorizing the sequence of steps, uh, first of all, you would not know uh, what to do at this location. Uh, but even if you did, you would, you know, from certain locations, from 15, you would not go to 17. From 13, you would not go to 11. You would or you would traverse in the order that you were presented. Um, and so there is a spatial arrangement. First of all, these chimpanzees remember where the food was because this is, you know, this is a field with trees and stuff. They know where they're going. This is a goal-directed behavior. And they are operating in an order that suggests that they know where shortcuts lie. They are not just mimicking pathways. 
Now, let me not uh, try to say that this is settled science. Turns out that it is not settled science. People do not buy this for universally for, for all animals. Uh, and there are sort of multiple counterclaims that there's no convincing evidence that this happens uh, for, for animals. And one of the reasons is that there are lots of other mechanisms that explain how intelligent, nobody's doubting that animals exhibit intelligent navigation behavior. People are just doubting whether the causal mechanism behind that is cognitive maps or other sensor capabilities. So for example, the, the obvious one is, well, there's visual landmarks. I know around my nest, there were a bunch of these obstacles. And turns out that people have done counterfactuals. You just you know, move the nest around for bees. And there are some cases in which they will actually get confused. They will go to the wrong place because the, the landmarks around them have changed. Um, there is a certain kind of butterfly that uses magnetic fields to navigate. And that's how it knows uh, various places. Uh, bees, for example, have, uh, we didn't know for the longest time, but they have UV light, polarized light sensors, so they can tell where the sun is and they can orient themselves with, this, with respect to the sun. Ants have, can sense chemicals and they leave uh, trails based on that. And so it's very hard to isolate. Are they building maps or are they just doing sensory adaptations? And so the question we asked was, well, is there evidence for cognitive maps in machines? Do AI agents build uh, mental maps. And the interesting thing here is we can precisely control. We know that we're not going to have chemical sensing. We're not going to have UV sensing. We can control what information goes in to eliminate these other plausible pathways to explain intelligent navigation. Why should you care about this question? Well, I think for one, it would shed light on the inner workings of these navigation agents. Like if I tell you that the, you know this thing can navigate, how can it navigate becomes the next question. Um, and one thing that I found really fascinating in this, in this entire line of work is this idea of convergent evolution. Um, unrelated organisms sometimes evolve structures that have the same functional purpose. Um, so for example, the role of wings in flight is a, is a perfectly valid, is, is a really interesting example. You know, Birds have wings, um, flying foxes uh, and bats have wings as well. Um, there were pterodactyls and, and pterosaurs had wings as well, which are extinct dinosaurs. Um, unfortunately, their closest ancestor is really, really far back. These are completely separate. Uh, so one of them is an ancestral mammal, one of them is a reptile, one of them is a bird. The fact that wings evolved completely separately in different parts of the evolutionary tree tells you not something about that branch of the evolutionary tree. It tells you something about the problem of flight. It tells you that the structure of wings is a natural solution. It has emerged three times in completely different circumstances, in completely different organizations. Therefore, there is something interesting here about the solution structure that you are discovering. And this has happened not just with wings, it has happened with the notion of poison as a def defensive mechanism, echolocalization, antennas, streamlined shapes, photosynthesis, even in plants, uh, has been sort of emerged multiple times uh, in unrelated organisms. So if we were able to find that maps emerge in AI systems, which are fundamentally different computational organisms, then that would not just be a claim about those AI systems, that would be another brick in the wall towards maps being a natural solution to the problem of navigation. That even if you did not know about the fact that there is such a thing as a map, just learning to navigate, you would invent the solution because it is a natural solution to that problem. So that's the, that's the claim and that's the motivation that I'm making. Any questions here? Because I feel like this can sometimes be contentious. Seems like everybody yeah. agrees with you, Drew. No, no, Anis, Anis is definitely gonna challenge me. No, I'm not challenging. I'm just wondering when, you, when you're talking about um, cognitive maps being a natural solution, um, are you, do you think uh, these are dense maps or are they just maps that give you a notion of directionality? Because the mouse, I forget if it was a mouse or a rat, but the uh, mouse uh, experiment could have been the fact that, well, it's, um, if I go northeast, 
I can find food. Yeah, um, yeah I think that's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, and this gets to the, to the question of like, what is the definition of a cognitive map again? Uh, like, are, am I like what, it's a data structure. What queries does that data structure support? Um, and it turns out that uh, there is disagreement even in the biology literature. So the Tolman seemed to believe something very close to what a metric map would provide that you get locations. It's sort of, if it's a 2D experiment, then you can do path planning on those things. Um, the modern interpretation, as far as I can tell, is implicit representations that can support queries like r comma theta. I know where things are. I know what obstacles might be close to them or, or on my way to them uh, that are much more fuzzy. Um, I will show you what we can support in our experiments. I will show you what we tried both. We tried sort of qualitative like maps that support shortcuts and maps that are like metric maps. And I will show you what evidence we find. The evidence for metric maps is there, but they're not always accurate. Um, shortcuts, just overwhelmingly, there is evidence that, that, that they're there. So I'll, I'll show you that. And just a quick question. Um, so uh, there's always this argument that airplanes um, don't flap wings and, and so on. And here, so we have methods that, that, that can build maps or, or do localization with higher level of precision. Uh, so why should we give up on those and, and uh, use cognitive maps, which are kind of rough and fuzzy instead? Yeah, yeah. So that's an excellent question. This is something that I've sort of wrestled with because I was one of those annoying people at the, you know, who would always ask people, why do we care like this? Like, so like, and then I'm not calling you annoying, Ruzba. I'm just like calling myself annoying. Uh, like, I, I think you're right that airplanes don't flap wings, but they have wings. Like we understand something about about aerodynamics that is consistent. The principles of aerodynamics tell us something that this sort of a structure is, is, is appearing in those, in those solutions. Um, there are going to be other factors that change how you, how you use that particular solution. Like all wings are not going to look the same. All maps are not going to look the same. Um, but I think it is, in, it is, in my mind, an insight into like this solution structure, like there are aspects of the solution that there are features of the solution that have to be present, that we're, we're gaining some insight there. But you're right, like I don't, I don't have a killer argument that will convince everybody of that. Um, and I'm not 100% convinced uh, of in 100% uh, agreement of this myself. Okay, so let me get into a bit more details. Uh, we're going to do point goal navigation again but we're going to control sensing. Like, as I said, we want to eliminate landmark-based navigation, like chemical, olfactory, like magnetic, those things are easy to uh, eliminate. Well, because we can't simulate them anyway, but we're even going to eliminate visual sensing. What we're going to do is it's still the same point goal navigation problem, but now the only sensor you have is this localization sensor that's giving you your ego motion. And therefore, you know where the target is. That's the only sensor. This is what the life in a day of our agent looks like. Everything else is for show. You just get to know this beep, 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 beep that tells you r comma theta of where the goal is located. There is an underlying structure. It has obstacles. Like you don't know where you're, where you're hitting and what, what's happening. There's not even a collision sensor. There is just a r comma theta uh, that you understand about where the goal is at every point of time. And turns out that this sensor actually has biological plausibility. In terms of uh, bees actually perform a particular faggle dance where they indicate r comma theta, exactly r comma theta of where they have found uh, flowers. Um, I won't play this entire video, but it's this, it's this fascinating video. Um, uh, there's sound. It's this fascinating video from the Virginia Tech bee group, which I didn't exist. Uh, which I didn't realize existed while I was there, uh, where they've sort of like segmented individual bees and have found that this motion that the bee is doing, uh, it's a particular dance. Um, and the angle at which that they're doing indicates the direction and the length 
uh, where, uh, how long the bee continue, continues down sailing is indicating uh, the radius or, or the distance uh, from, uh, from, so approximately one second is 750 meters of distance. Um, and so you can actually decode this movement. They're going back and forth. They're doing this dance only in this one direction. This uh, direction is with respect to the sun. The length of that dance is proportional, the, or the time of that dance is proportional to the distance. And they are indicating r comma theta of where the flower is located. And this is just a well understood phenomena that this, this is what bees do. We don't have doubts about this. We have doubts about how then other bees are able to navigate. Okay, um, and so we're going to you know, follow the same architectural phenomena, except architecture, except we're even going to block out, like from a machine learning perspective, this was trivial, just turn your CNN off. It's the same LSTM, there's an encoding of R comma theta and just unroll your LSTM. Um, so there's only ego motion sensing, it renders other mechanisms to explain navigation redundant. There's no visual landmarks. There's no olfactory gradients. There's nothing else. There's no inductive bias towards mapping of any kind. There's no map supervision. There's no auxiliary task. Everything that I said holds true. The only thing that you receive are dense rewards based on navigation. You do not know that there's a 3D problem here. You do not know that there's a mapping problem here. There's no spatial memory. It's just generic LSTMs and fully connected layers. There's not even a CNN, there's no convolution. There's just no idea of a spatial structure. And in this zone, I'm going to tell you that first of all, blind agents can navigate very well. Um, they actually, so on the y-axis is performance, on the x-axis is steps of experience. The green lines are these lines, the dashed lines are the sighted agents, the solid lines are the blind agents. The blind agents are, have achieved high success in the 90s. They don't match the same performance. They don't get 99.9, .9, but they get to mid 90s. Where they lack is SPL or path efficiency. They are not very efficient, but they get there. They get the job done. They will reach the goal. They just won't be very efficient. And this is what that qualitatively looks like. This is the same episode that I had showed you. This is a sighted agent, a depth-based agent that's traversing effectively what looks like the shortest path. This is a blind agent that's solving the same episode, just much more inefficiently, because what it's doing is it's slamming its face into a wall and then following the wall along. It goes to one end, gets stuck, goes to the other end, and then it will discover the pathway that will lead it to the goal. It's, so it's highly inefficient in terms of path efficiency, but it will solve the problem. It is successful. And notice nothing changed from our perspective. We just turned the CNN on, off. This is another agent. This is another sighted agent. This is the second episode that I've shown you. Notice that this is a more sophisticated environment. There were hallways, there were you know, doorways to pass through. When I showed you the sighted agent, maybe this did not feel very impressive. Maybe, you know, this is a straight line path. Here's what a blind agent does. It will also solve this problem by following walls and obstacles. Goes down one dead end, makes its way back. Go down another dead end, will make its way back again. Follow another dead end get stuck, make its way back. I'm gonna skip ahead, but yes, this, like I'm actually may have run out of the video here, but this succeeds, this works. Kiana. Um, so why does it move further away from the goal in the beginning? Yeah, uh, that's an interesting question. We've been asked that. And like, I think what's happening is that sometimes it, in some cases it's based on its uh, initial heading. And so what it does is it's trying to, our hypothesis, we don't know this for a fact, we have actually haven't been able to come up with experiments that would confirm this. We believe that what it's trying to do is hit an obstacle as quickly as possible because obstacles can be followed along. Um, and so it's, it's ignoring the, the goal. I will show you other experiments where the first thing that the agent does is turn to face the goal. Um, it'll be in a different circumstance, but here we believe what, what it's doing is that it's trying to get as quickly as possible in contact with an obstacle. Any other questions?
Okay. So blind agents can navigate. They're just not very efficient. And by the way, this was known all, ago, all along, just not to us. Uh, there's an emergence of what is known as bug algorithms. So there's, there are papers from the 1980s um, where people actually sat down and studied exactly this problem. A point robot with localization sensing and the ability to sense contact with obstacles when provided with a piecewise polygonal, piecewise polygonal map of arbitrary number of uh, sides, you can always prove that there is a way to find your way from start to target. It's just not very efficient. And you prove certain algorithms that have to basically figure out when you come in contact. So uh, the existence of these algorithms is essentially like turn to face the target, go towards the target, realize when you're in touch with an obstacle. Now you have to follow it right or left. And at some point you have to figure out, are you going around in loops or should I let go of the target and start moving to it? Should I let go of this obstacle or should I start moving towards the target again? And there's an entire family of algorithms that have to solve this problem. Am I going around in circles? Should I let go? Should I start moving towards the target again? And am I in contact with something else? They exist, but we did not know them. Um, and this algorithm, this, this RL, RL model is, is basically this rediscovering these same strategies. We actually compared to a clairvoyant bug algorithm where what the bug will do is when coming in contact, it has to either go right or left. We actually compared to a clairvoyant bug in the sense that we will, as an oracle, come in and tell you what the right choice is, go right or left. Against a clairvoyant bug, the RL algorithm is more efficient. Um, the success rates are similar but the RL algorithm is actually more efficient than a clairvoyant bug because it's not just following walls all the time. It is cutting through free space and cutting through free space in an efficient way, which is not what a bug algorithm does. Um, so that's an interesting sort of finding and claim here. Okay, so blind agents can navigate. So the next obvious question is how, like using what mechanism? Um, I showed you this bug algorithm. Turns out that it, bug algorithms are not as easy. The picture is not this clean. You have to figure out, are you going round and round in circles? Have you been to a point before? Uh, should you let go of this obstacle? Are you close to the target? Like when should you let go? Um, and so obviously you, what you need is memory. You need to remember what you've done um, and bug algorithms have to keep an entire trajectory around and be able to compute shortest paths and things on that trajectory. Um, so in our neural network, the only source of memory is this RNN or this LSTM, right? So we actually checked, is memory important? Um, so on the x-axis here is the amount of past steps in of, of trajectory that we are allowing this LSTM to remember. So we will actually provide it a bounded LSTM. We will keep the last 10, last 100 and chop everything before that. So we will give it a window LSTM and turns out that memory is really important. You don't reach the peak performance till you are remembering the last 1000 steps. If you're not exposed to the last 1000 steps, even if I cut it down to the last 100 steps and drop significantly, the reactive models are just garbage. They're not going to be able to solve this problem because they're thrashing. You can't actually tell if, you're, uh, if, you're, if you've been uh, to some place or not. So there's, you don't get to peak performance till you remember long things in the past. Okay. So if the memory is important, the next obvious question is, well, what does the memory store? Like, what does it contain? Um, and here we took a playbook from Menzel's chimpanzee experiments. And what we said is we're going to do repeated trials in the same environment. So we're going to first train a blind episode, a blind agent to go from source to target. Then we're going to extract its LSTM representation that it's constructed, the cell state and the hidden state or from this test time phenomena, we're going to give it to a second agent and we're going to ask the second agent to either go again from source to target or from target to source. So it is initialized with the memory of the first agent. And if it cuts across, if it does not traverse the same sequence of steps, if it cuts across, takes shortcuts, then this suggests that there is spatial information in that memory. Because if all that that memory was remembering, right, right, left, right, right, left, right, right, left, you have to know something about the space in order to take out a, just a low dimensional embedding of right, right, left is not always what will give you uh, 
shortcuts. So there are, there, are, there are going to be shortcuts and we will find that our agent will cut out excursions, meaning that there are loops that happen where it will not go explore those regions again. And if this is our hypothesis, if this happens, then this suggests that there is some spatial information in this representation. So this is what that looks like. What we're going to do is we're going to take the last hidden state of an unrolled frozen LSTM, that's our agent. We're going to go feed it as H0 to a new LSTM. So we're not re re retaining the parameters. This is a second agent, it's just a probe. And we're going to train that second agent with this initialization. So this is what that looks like. This is the first agent trying to find its way, fumbling around from source to target, going down hallways, going down excursions, going down rooms, turning its way around. And just to make the video efficient, what I'm going to do is when it reaches the target, I'm going to initialize the episode from target to source. We've tried both source to target, target to source. And what you're going to see is a stark difference in the behavior. It has reached target. Now this is the second agent. Notice it does not explore anymore. It cuts through shortcuts. It does not hug corners as much. On its way back, it's almost as if it knows where the pathway is. It's, it's, it's very efficient on its way back. Here's another um, episode where this is the way forward. This is the agent trying to go from source to target, following walls, going back, traversing. Let me jump a bit forward because it's pretty long. Hitting target number one, hitting every, all sorts of obstacles, reaches the target. On its way back, it's still going to collide, but notice the lack of excursions. All right. I think Ani had his hand raised and somebody else as well. This is very interesting, Dhruv. Uh, one thing that is that struck me was that the the initial agent and then the agent with the enhanced the implanted, yeah, agent and probe. Let's call them agent and probe. The agent and probe um, are their end goals or their tasks are highly correlated. So in one case, um, you know, the the agent goes from A to B. And then the probe has to go from A to B again, or yeah. B to A, right? Yeah. I wonder if this would also be the case if you had, if the agent was a random exploration agent, who just started seeing things. And then the probe agent now has access to hmm. presumably a cognitive map built by this exploration agent, hmm. and then was able to do that more efficiently. Fascinating. Yeah. So uh, if you have learned to not go to the same places again, if you have been encouraged to do exploration, maybe you have a fairly complete mental map. Um, yeah, we haven't done that experiment. Uh, one thing I hesitate in that scenario is I don't really know how to measure performance. I don't know when to call an exploration agent done. Like I know when SPL is 100, is close to 100. I know when success is 100. I know when I have a good agent that can go from source to target. I have a much less confidence in like exploration metrics. Like, no, but you could have the agent be an explorer. Yeah. And then probe agents. One Agreed. initialized randomly and one initialized with the explorer's memory. Agree. So I can compare to random. I just can't know if that agent is a good agent. So should I, the differences I'm seeing is that uh, like, is that the best that this agent could have done or like, I just didn't train that long enough, but yeah, it's a fair point. Why I, I will consider this. We'll, we'll, we'll take this as feedback. I think there's a second question. I can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, I have basically three quick questions. Number one is how long was this um, blind agent trained for? And during this training curve, is there some like apparent moment where like this mapping behavior emerges or is it uh, just a slow progression of it's getting better and better? Or is it like at one point it clicks and now all of a sudden it's making maps. And so the other, the probe gets much better. 
Yeah, uh, excellent question. So the first part is answered here. Um, so they was trained for like, you know, I, I forget whether we're choosing the final checkpoint at 2 million or whether we're using the 1.4. Uh, but I don't think, uh, so uh, the behavior is, it's being trained out for long as well. Um, we don't see any sharp jumps in performance that there is a discrete moment. It's sort of like a logarithmic saturating curve. Um, what I don't know is whether the map phenomena is significantly different at some point. We, we haven't done this comparison with checkpoints along the way. That's a good question. I see. My second question then is, do you see a difference with this probe doing uh, cutting out shortcuts phenomenon? Does this diminish if the scenes are larger or if the navigation task itself is more complicated? So I know there's some very long, large scenes in Habitat. Is this um, correlated at all to the length of a total scene? So do you are sort of like running into a boundary if how much your memory can retain. Interesting. Uh, I don't believe we are running into a boundary of how much our memory can retain because, actually, no, I take that back. The success is going to as high as what we think is, like we're, it's the success is going to high 90s. Uh, this is in Matterport environments, which are the larger ones compared to Gibson. and. Success, high success in Matterport environments suggests that you know we're not these agents are navigating well. Uh, we're, we're not testing them in small environments, um, but I don't know if. But I guess I'm asking it more about the probe SPL if we're talking about concrete metrics, right? Yeah. So you would imagine the probe SPL would decrease for larger scenes if this were the case that you would be like lacking the ability to remember enough. Interesting. Yeah, no, I don't know the answer to that question. We haven't tested it. Probe SPL as a function of the of the length of the of the uh, of the episode. I'm pretty sure Eric looked at it at one point, but I, I don't know if I I don't there is we haven't we don't have that plot in our paper. Like I I don't have that answer right off the top of my head. I see. And I have a very quick third question. Have you tried putting in auxiliary objectives for the probe that are along the way or close to? the um, actual path you took. So instead of going from A to B and B to A, you go for to from you know B to C and C is like kind of close. Yeah, so we, we've informally played around with those sorts of things. Uh, and I will show you like even in the kind of uh, excursion type experiments, you'll see that, uh, but we haven't done the full sort of experiment that you're, we, we haven't done any sort of auxiliary. We have not nudged or tried to make the auxiliary experiments better. In, in, in some sense, from our perspective, the probe is just a way of understanding what the agent is doing. It's the agent that's the primary thing. The probe is just our, so if we can derive an understanding from our experiments, that's good enough. Like if we, if we invest in time and in effort into making that better, like it's good, like maybe we learn something else, but it doesn't change what we've already learned in, in some sense. That's why we refer to them as probes. They're not, they're not actual agents in their own uh, full right and sense. Okay, awesome. Thank you. I really like this uh, paper. This is very interesting. Thank you. Rose Bay. Is there another person want to ask a question or? Okay. So... I have, yeah, I have partial visibility at mine. So go on. Yeah. A few years ago, in one of our navigation works with UK Zoom and others, uh, so we visual uh, we had Tisney visualization of the embeddings, and it showed that uh, locations that are next to each other cluster together. So it basically kind of a kind of a it um, the parameters of the network kind of encode the map of map map of the environment, so similar to here, but but we had um, we had observations as well. So do you have such things? Uh, have you tried to visualize the, these embeddings to see like how, how they cluster? Yeah, yeah, I will show you that. Uh, not specifically the clustering, but I will show you a decoding process from these embeddings. And that will, I think, answer some of your questions okay. in, a, in a few slides. Ani. So I wonder if, um, I, want, I wonder if your agent through its training has learned to avoid the same mistake twice. Because I can imagine during DDPPO training, you know, at some point you, you keep making the same mistake again and again, and then you get less reward. And that's, that's a skill that you probably learn during training. Mm -hmm. 
what your probe is doing now, it's almost like it's an agent that suddenly had to do the task again. And so it's a skill that it has learned is don't make the same mistake twice. Yep. But it's able to do this clearly using some knowledge of geometry, right? Like, well, if I, instead of traversing around, you know, the, the two sides of a right angle triangle, you can just go along the hypotenuse. Yep. Um, so now I think it'd be interesting to see if a mistake in one task was actually a good idea in another task. Uh, I think that's what I, I'm getting back to my exploration agent is mm. uh, if it can exploit geometry in a different context, that would decouple this notion of, is it exploiting geometry to do, to, to generalize to new tasks? Is it able to use that cognitive map intelligently or is it just sort of, uh, is it just avoiding its same mistake? Um, yeah, not really got it. A thought. Yeah, I think, I think it's a good thought. You're trying to decouple behavior from spatial understanding, like, cause with the sp same spatial understanding, I can exhibit multiple behaviors. Like uh, maybe I can, I'm not trying to be as efficient. Maybe I'm trying to be really inefficient. I'm trying to go to like spread out as much as I can. Yeah. That's an interesting one. I, I like the, the exploration agent memory thing. Um, one thing I want to push on is that there has to be a reason to create that representation in the first place. There has to be some pressure, learning pressure on the agent that it creates that memory representation. Yeah, I don't know how well exploration agents do blind in the first place, like you find out. Okay, uh, we have one more question. And Kiana, I'm aware of the time. I think we're like 12. Yes, we are, yeah, we are running out of time. Uh, so Clement, if you can hold your questions, maybe we can uh, let Drew finish his talk and then we can have the open discussion. Yeah, and maybe I can end in two minutes. I'll try to get to like a couple of more pieces of evidence and, it, oh no, I just, yeah, okay. Um, all right. So. Uh, sort of the main quantitative evaluation that we did, we tried both second nav source to target, second nav target to source. And what we find is that compared to, you know, random or all zero memory and untrained agent memory. So the same LSTM encoding of the test time episode, but just with an agent that has an untrained uh, set of weights versus a trained uh, set of uh, agent weights, um, you see a gap of, uh, of 14% improvement in SPL. Um, this is about half the gap or like more than half the gap of what you would close if I equipped you with a camera. So on your way back or in a second environment, you're acting almost you know, 50 to 70% of the way as if you could see. And I think that is, that is compelling evidence. And by the way, there's no, there's no biases in the source to target, target to source. It's the same amount of difficulty in the sampling of those things. Okay, so do memories contain explicit maps? Uh, that's like, these are implicit shortcuts are implicit evidence. And turns out, yeah, you can basically take the last hidden layer, train a deconvolution network, supervise it with a patch of, the, of, a, of a top down map where uh, dark uh, gray indicates free space, uh, light gray indicates occupied, and this binary segmentation of, um, of this map cropped around your episode turns out that you can actually decode these things with, of course, the gradients frozen. Like you, the representations did not know that they were going to be used to decode maps. And the average IOU that you get from a trained agent memory versus an untrained agent memory is 32 versus 12 with a histogram where some IOUs are going all the way to 0 0.6, 0 0.8. So you're really decoding not just where you went. Notice the blue pathway is where the agent went. The agent also is able to infer that there is a hallway. The hallway has another wall. That wall is typically, I'm in contact with this wall, but there must be another wall on the other side, right? That's present. That notion is present in this, uh, in this agent's memory. And that um, actually is what is exploited by the agent, by the probe on its way back. Um, I will end with a summary slide. I had some more thoughts, but I think it's, it's Good to end. Uh, 
I think we might have lost through implicit representations that enable shortcuts. And in some cases, they can you can decode explicit maps. I didn't talk about limits, but turns out the memory is task specific in the sense that the agent explicitly forgets excursions. If you actually look at the decoded map and ask the question, where is the map accurate? Where is the map inaccurate? Turns out the regions of inaccuracies of the map are where the agent took an excursion. So it went into a room, came back. Its representation will basically forget anything about that room. So there's pressures on the memory to forget excursions which is exactly why on the way back, it does not explore that space because the memory just says, you know, forget about that part. That part doesn't exist. Uh, and with that, we thought was an interesting thing. So where does that leave us? I think another brick in the wall for cognitive maps uh, and just sort of bringing it back. I think, I think the reason why we're building embodied AI systems is not just so that we can, you know, actually, use it as a pathway to intelligence, but actually learn about the nature of intelligence. Um, and I sort of leave you with that note and, and stop here. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Drew. This was a very interesting topic and interesting talk. Um, let's see if we have, I think we have uh, time for one or two uh, question hops if uh, we have anyone. Uh, I think Clement, you wanted to ask something. Hey, thank you, Kiana. Sorry, I, I just got a quick thought uh, of what about what Ani said, uh, like an exploration agent. I wonder if it would be possible to set up a multi-goal, like continuous point nav um, agent that is blind, and though so it would not have a probe using its memory, but the agent would rely on its own past experience and sort of try to reach several goals in an environment. Like this would make trajectory rollouts much longer, and there'd be all kinds of problems. But it'd be interesting to see how far you could push. You know, would, would Ideally, it would get better with every consecutive target it's doing because it would learn more and more about the space. But it'd be interesting to see like where the limits of forgetting are and stuff like this in this environment. And it's sort of straightforward and measurable more so than like a random exploration agent. Yeah, I agree. This, this, is, this is something that we have received as feedback and we are considering like to consider the multi point goal navigation problem, A to B, B to C, and then hand over the memory and try to see if you can go from C to A. Um, some part of that has already been explored because A to B is not a straight line path, right? So if there are excursions and you take shortcuts, you are in some sense going from C to A without passing through B. But yeah, we can we can make that more explicit by actually making that as like a episode and a, and a target. But I also mean if, if target C is between A and B or somewhere similar, you would imagine that the, the journey from B to C would be more streamlined than the journey from A to C because now you know where the excursions are, presumably. Agreed, but uh, in that setting, you are explicitly learning to reuse memory. And that's now getting baked in into your agent. Your agent has learned to reuse memory across episodes. In the experiments that we've been doing, the agent is not aware that its memory gets used for something. It just does its task. And so we can make claims about what it must be solving in order to accomplish its task and ignore everything else. And that was like a particular emphasis that we were going for. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think if we don't have any more questions, uh, thank you, Drew. Thank you for accepting our invitation and thanks for giving this talk. Um, hope to see you soon again. Thanks, folks. Hopefully, we'll yeah. get to see each other in person at some point soon. Hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye.